The sermon today is titled, The Everlasting Kingdom. It's based on 2 Peter 1, 1 1-15. If you'd like to follow along, turn in your Bibles to the passage. In his first epistle, the Apostle Peter wrote about our heavenly inheritance as Christians. Let's take a moment and read the passage. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him yet believing. You rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. While in this life, we are at times grieved by various trials, we wait for the coming of the Lord. Believing, we can, Peter said, rejoice with joy inexpressible in our hope. As Christians, God has given us many things. It is through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross that our sins are forgiven. It is also through Christ that we have the hope of being in heaven with the Lord. Today, we will study the first part of 2 Peter chapter 1. First, in verses 1 through 4, Christ has called you. Verse 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter addresses those who had obtained like precious faith with them. They were of the same precious faith. They, along with Peter and the other disciples, had obtained the faith through the righteousness of Jesus. Having obtained the faith, they needed to continue in the precious faith of Christ. As was said by Peter, remember that Jesus Christ is our God and Savior. He's not just a man. He's not just even a good man. He is our God and Savior. Peter continues, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. While a key term of the first epistle is hope, a key term of the second epistle is knowledge. For people of like precious faith, the blessings of grace and peace are abundantly found in the knowledge of our God and of our Lord. Think about that. Grace and peace are found abundantly in the knowledge of our Lord. Verse 3, he said, as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Peter wrote that we have all things that pertain to life and godliness. Just how much has God not given as to pertain to life and God. He's given us all things that have that pertain to life and godliness. He left nothing out. We have all that we need. We see that this was accomplished through the knowledge of Christ. 
who had called us by glory and virtue. Again, not by our own glory, our own virtue, but by the glory and virtue of Christ. Verse 4, he said, By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. By his glory and his virtue, we have exceedingly great and precious promises. Just think of the greatness of how the greatness exceeds every expectation. The precious promises of Christ, of salvation. It's through these promises that we may experience the divine nature and share in the glory of God as children of God. One thinks of the world and the, the lust of the world. The lust of the world, the lust of the eye and the pride of life. He said that having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We learn in passages like John chapter 3 where Jesus speaks to Nicodemus that we must be born again. Speaking of being born anew, a spiritual rebirth. Not a fleshly rebirth. A spiritual rebirth. John 3 and 3 and also John 3 and 5, born of water and the Spirit. And in 1 Peter 1 and 23, again, we see being born again through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. As children of God, we have the hope of an incorruptible inheritance reserved for us in heaven. In 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5, Peter said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And so those who have been born again have the hope of an incorruptible inheritance reserved in heaven. As children of God, we ought to strive to be holy in all of our conduct. 1 Peter 1, 13-16 Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. That's another way of saying, prepare yourself. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourself to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Peter quotes the Old Testament. Be holy, for I am holy. As children of God, we ought to be obedient to our Heavenly Father. We ought to live in holiness as he is holy. We ought to have this mind that we get ourselves ready, that we are sober-minded, that we Rest our hope upon him and his grace, thinking of the coming of Christ, that we prepare ourselves, we ready ourselves, not conforming ourselves to the lust of this world, as was in our ignorance, but now in knowledge, conforming ourselves to God. Number two, add to your faith. Verses 5 to 9. Verse 5, he says, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. We have been given exceedingly great and precious promises. Verse 4. We ought to make every effort 
give all diligence to add to our faith, to supplement our faith with these things, with these qualities. Let's look briefly at, at these seven things. First, virtue. Christ called us by virtue, by his own excellence and goodness. Second Peter 1 and verse 3. And Peter uses the same term translated as virtue, verse 3, here in verse 5. Christians are to add or to supply virtue. Paul told the brethren in Philippians 4 and verse 8, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things or think, meditate on these things. And he lists a number of things in that passage. If there's any virtue, again, meditate on virtue. In relationship to believers, this virtue may refer to moral excellence, conformity to the divine standard of of right, of righteousness. Included in the word virtue may also be qualities of courage and strength. Remember what Paul told the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. This was certainly needed in the in the face of the persecution and tribulation that they that they would endure. All who live godly lives will suffer persecution, Paul said. Number two, knowledge. This term is found seven times in this epistle. Again, it is a key term in this book. Consider the relationship of knowledge to Christ. And here are a number of the passages. Second Peter 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 8, and also in chapter 2, 20 and chapter 3, 18. The lesson is grow in knowledge. Second Peter 3, 17 to 18, he said, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. Again, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved other than the name Jesus, the Christ. It is certainly possible to fall from our steadfastness. Otherwise, why would he warn them? Beware, lest you also fall from your steadfastness. It's also possible to be led away from God with the error of the wicked. And so the need for caution and vigilance. He said, instead, grow in the knowledge of Christ. Peter cautions us not to leave the truth and to return to the pollutions of the world. We're not talking about smog. We're talking about sin. 2 Peter 2, 19 to 21, he warns the brethren. Paul, too, exhorts us to abound and to increase in the knowledge. And he also teaches us to to grow, to abound, and to increase. Philippians 1, 9, 10. Colossians 1, 9 to 10. Number three, self-control. Exercise restraint over yourself. Everybody wants to control other people. Focus on controlling yourself. Hold your passion and your desires in hand. Abstain from lusts. 1 Peter chapter 2, 11 to 12, Beloved, I be beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, 
they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Set a good example. Hopefully, when people see you and your good works, they glorify God. In the Sermon on the Mount, and with the Beatitudes of Christ, we see the blessings promised, the kingdom of heaven to to the faithful, to those who are persecuted. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, Jesus taught. He also said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Abstain from lust. Exercise self-control, temperance. We think of temperance as, as abstaining from alcohol. But it can involve other things, too. Uh, self-control, discipline over ourselves. Paul also wrote concerning self-control, Galatians 5.23. He talked of the fruit of the Spirit. And one part of the fruit of the Spirit, self-control. In Titus 1.7-9, he speaks of qualities, qualifications of elders or bishops. And he said that these elders must be self-controlled. There were other people who were insubordinate. But the elders were, were needed to be self-controlled themselves. And comparing Christians to athletes, Paul wrote that every athlete is temperate. Again, temperate or exercising self-control. 1 Corinthians 9 and 25. Peter's point is that we ought to add self-control. Sadly, though, some people, even the brethren, are without self-control. Not true of everybody. But it's certainly true of some. Second, Peter, Second Timothy chapter three, one to three, he describes uh, in a list these people who had a form of godliness. Well, he said that some were particularly without self-control or temperance. Number four, Peter says, add perseverance, patience, and steadfastness are both important particularly given the trials that Christians face. In service of Christ, perseverance is the quality of continuing to serve, to persist, despite the difficulties and obstacles. 1 Peter 4.16, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. We ought to glorify God in the name of Christ. As Christians, we belong to Christ. We are followers. We are disciples. We follow our master. We belong to Christ. As Christians, do not be ashamed if you suffer, but rather glorify God. And so perseverance, the idea of going through the severe. Paul wrote in Romans 5, 3 to 4, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Job talked of growing stronger and stronger. Here was a man who held to the way, to his way, the way of righteousness. In Paul's epistle to the Romans, here in Romans 5, he lists some, the value of perseverance, that it produces character and ultimately hope. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 and 10, but you have carefully followed my perseverance. And so his life was an example of perseverance. To think of the things that Paul went through for the faith of Christ. And he glorified God in, in his weakness. Job is given as an example of patience and perseverance by the, by the disciple James in James 5, 10 to 11. You have heard of the patience of Job or you have heard of Job's perseverance number five 
we need to add godliness. Verse 6, godliness is the quality of piety towards God, honoring one's duties to God with great reverence and respect. God has given us, Peter said, all things that pertain to life and godliness. 2 Peter 1.3 Peter cautioned the brethren to live in godliness in this world. 2 Peter 3.11, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Since all these things shall be destroyed. Of course, talking about the end of this world. Our hope as Christians is not this world, but heaven above second peter 3 11 so given that this is that the end will come prepare yourself and live with holy conduct and godliness number six add brotherly kindness as christians we ought to grow in kindness or affection for one another in this world we are like pilgrims, sojourners. We're just passing through. It's as though we live, we're living in a tent, you know, a temporary dwelling place, as the tent is a you know, dwelling place for our soul, living in this body. One of these days, we'll pull up the tent and, and depart from this world. Peter taught his fellow Christians to show love of the brethren, or the brother, the brothers, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. First Peter one twenty two, love the brotherhood. First Peter two and seventeen, and also love as brothers. First Peter three and eight. Sometimes it's helpful to know that we are not alone, and that there are others who are suffering for Christ in the brotherhood. Consider how Peter described Paul as our beloved brother Paul. Peter and the others love Paul. 2 Peter 3.15 We ought to, to show brotherly kindness and affection to one another today as Christians. We are part of the same spiritual family. We've been born again. And we have those same inheritance. Heaven. Number seven. Add love. Jesus taught us to love God and love our neighbor as ourself. Mark 12 and 29 to 31. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. He taught us to love our neighbors and not just our friends, but also our enemies. Matthew 5, 43 to 49. As our, as our an, in, an enemies, perhaps, uh, we even we want them to to be saved too, and so we we certainly want them to repent, so that they can be saved. We know that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, and also that God desires for all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Ultimately, people make up their own mind and make their own decisions in this world. Uh, Peter simply. Wanted to give the uh, the information and for to encourage them to make the right choices. Sharing our love for one another that we do care, showing that we care, certainly can help in in sharing the message, the gospel of Christ. Second Peter one and eight. He continues. He said, "For if these are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ." These things include virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Just as we've studied here in 2 Peter 1, 5 to 7. Peter says that if these things belong to you and abound in you, you will not be idle nor unfruitful, but productive and fruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And think, think about that. If these things are, are yours, if they belong to you, and that they abound 
with you. You will not be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord. As Christians, we belong to Christ. And as Christians, these things ought to belong to us. That these are ours and that they abound within us. Verse 9 for he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Now, it's not as though one, that Peter is saying that we earn our salvation, that we merit our deliverance somehow by practicing these, these seven things. He's simply saying that, that by the grace of God and by the sacrifice of Christ, that our sins are forgiven, and that we can arise to walk in newness of life, as, as Paul, saw, Paul taught. Jesus died for our sins so that we could live for righteousness. Read 1 Peter 2, 24. Jesus died for our sins so that he might bring us to God. 1 Peter 3 and 18. The only way to God is through Jesus Christ. By obeying the truth of the gospel, Peter said our souls were purified. 1 Peter 1 and 22. Redeemed, he said, with the precious blood of Christ. At the beginning, he talked about the how we share this like precious faith. And now he speaks of the precious blood of Christ. We were not redeemed with silver and gold. Those things men count as precious. But we were redeemed with something that could not be attained by man. Uh, Jesus gave his own life for our sins, for our redemption. Now, Peter says that he who lacks these qualities, these, these things, is short-sighted. He lacks the, the sight to see beyond this world to the promise of eternal life in heaven. Some people only see the things here, but we ought to, to think of our hope as Christians. Again, we are as sojourners in this world. This world is just a, a place, a temporary place for us. We're just passing through. Don't be short-sighted. And the person who is, he has spiritual myopia or nearsightedness. Maybe he can see things that are closed up, but he can't see those things that are far off. Second Peter 1.11, he mentions something that's, that's in the future. Our hope. Don't be short-sighted. Number three, make your call and election sure, Peter said in verses 10 to 11. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. Again, there's the possibility that you can stumble and be lost. Otherwise, why would he warn us? Why would he warn the brethren of the possibility of stumbling? God called us by glory and virtue, 2 Peter 1, 3. In view of these things, Verses 5 to 9, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. We know that God has called us by the gospel, and those who believe and obey the gospel can be saved. As we continue in it, we know that we are being saved. Again, remember, there is the possibility of stumbling and being lost. The called. Peter described the brethren as the elect of God. 1 Peter 1, 2, chapter 2, 6, and also chapter 5, 13. They were also called by God. 1 Peter 1, 15, chapter 2 and 9, 21, chapter 3, 9, chapter 5 and 10. And if you have time, check out those passages. Remember, the brethren are described as the elect, the called by God. Verse 11, he says, 
For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is the promise of an entrance into the everlasting kingdom of Christ. In this passage, the word kingdom refers to the heavenly kingdom, which is, he describes as being everlasting or eternal. Note that the text speaks of an entrance into that kingdom that is yet to be enjoyed. Think about that welcome of having such an entrance into that kingdom. Of course, uh, we know that we must be born again in order to see or to, to, to enter the kingdom of God. In the Bible, in the New Testament, kingdom oftentimes refers to, to the church. In this particular passage, we see this final stage of the, the uh, future stage of the, of the church, the reward, the hope of heaven. For example, here's a couple passages related to our passage here in Peter. Acts 14, 21 to 22, Luke records, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, We must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. And so here we find that there were those who had heard the gospel. They became disciples, Christians, uh, how that they strengthened those uh, who had become disciples. Uh, and he encouraged them. They encouraged them to continue in the faith. Be faithful. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. And so, again, he didn't hide or conceal that they would face tribulation as Christians. However, there was that hope, there is that hope of the kingdom of God. 2 Timothy 4.18, Paul said, And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord will deliver me. Peter, Paul did not deny that he would face evil, that there would be evil works done against him in preaching Christ, but he trusted the Lord to deliver him and to preserve him. Not that he would not face these things, but that ultimately he could be faithful and continue in the faith and enter into the kingdom of God, his heavenly kingdom. 2 Peter 1, 12 to 15. In 2 Peter 1, if you would, turn to that, that passage again. Here we find the conclusion, at least for our lesson, concerning what we've already studied in the chapter. In verses 12 to 15, Peter says, For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it's right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. In verse 12, we learn from Peter how he desired that his brethren enter into that everlasting kingdom. And so he reminded them of these important things, even though they knew them. It's always good to hear it again. Uh, well, I've already believed and obeyed the gospel. Why do I need to hear the gospel again? If you ask that question, then you're showing your need 
to hear the gospel again. I think about the church at Corinth and some of the problems that they they were having among their their members. And Paul wrote to them concerning the resurrection in chapter 15. And he reminded them of the gospel, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ, that Christ died for our sins, and that he was seen. He resurrected, and people saw him alive, friend and family and foe, last of all himself. And Peter or Paul later in the chapter said, why do I stand in jeopardy every hour if the dead do not raise? And he did believe. Peter said that he would continue to remind the brethren as long as he was still alive in this world. Verse 13, he says, as long as I am in this tent, he looked at his body as if it were a tent. Paul did the same thing. He said to stir you up by reminding you. Sometimes we need stirred up. We need reminded. He did this knowing that he would soon die. Verse 14. And so he was careful to do so given that he would soon die. Not a natural death, but a violent death against him for the sake of Christ. But we see that he did so just as Christ had showed him. Verse 14, and we know from, from the gospel account that, that Jesus told him the manner in which he would die. Peter said in verse 15 that even after his death, his departure, his exodus from this world, the, the inspired word of truth would remind them, would serve to remind them of these things. He says, so that you have a reminder of these things after my decease, verse 15. That word is literally exodus, or the word means departure. As we're familiar with the book of Exodus and departing from Egypt. Peter believed that he would die in the near future. He pointed out that Jesus had showed him how he would die back in John 21, 18 to, to 19. And according to sources outside the Bible, such as the historian Eusebius, uh, Peter was crucified under Nero. And so Nero ordered Peter's crucifixion. He also ordered Paul's beheading by the sword. And so both men, according to sources outside the scripture, died, died in the faith. For the sake of Christ. Crucified under Nero. Here Peter had hope. Of that heavenly kingdom. As we have hope. Paul wrote of our one hope. Of course our one hope is found in Christ. What do we learn from this today? Well. One thing is. Do not allow trials or, or errors. To separate you from the faith of Christ whether things that are happening to you are being done to you or things that are being taught to you, which are false. Don't allow error. Don't allow trials or tribulation either to separate you from the faith of Christ. Again, there's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. Persevere because the hope of the everlasting kingdom in heaven. If you're not a Christian, consider becoming one today. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? If so, repent. Confess your faith in him. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And be baptized for remission of your sins. Acts 2.38. Mark 16.16. 16, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Believe what? Believe the gospel. Do you believe the gospel? If you're a Christian, but you've been unfaithful, repent and go to God in prayer. He will forgive you. We thank you for being here today, and we hope that you're blessed, and we believe you are in, in studying the word.